Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 67. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Good day to you, Dr. Woolman. And a wonderful day to you, Christina. How are you? So absolutely fantabulous. Yeah, is that because of our special guest absolutely. today? I know it. Of course, of course. Yeah. I'm yeah. flying. I'm bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> You're excited. I can tell. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your host on Magical Medical Tour today, uh, co-hosting with Christina as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in search of optimal health. And today we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Mikio Sanke, a pioneer in acupuncture and the founder or an, and originator of esoteric acupuncture, which is going to be our topics today. Uh, so, Christina, I know that people around the world are uh, anxious to hear what Dr. Mikio has to say, and how can they get in touch with us if they need to ask him a question? Well, thank you, Glenn. Um, at any time during this live presentation, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into that comment box. Now, be sure to click submit uh, so that I can see it on this side and read it out to our guests. Uh, if you prefer, you are very welcome to join us on our conference line, which is 323-476-3997, and your ID is 607-393-POUND. And if that went by a little too fast, not to worry. It will show up on the screen as our presentation continues. Thank you so much, Glenn. As I said before, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Mikio Sanke with us. He's an international speaker, lecturer, and teacher. He's an author of multiple books, which we're going to be speaking about today. He's the originator of esoteric acupuncture. And... Uh, he actually, in full disclosure, he was probably the catalyst for Magical Medical Tour. When we think about it, he was the one that introduced Christina and I to each other uh, during one of the Yoga Hub World virtual conferences, and uh, the rest is history. And mm -hmm. in really full disclosure, uh, you know, at the, en <laughs> at the uh, end of... Uh, I'm starting to feel naked, Glenn. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, and that's a good thing. Uh, at the end of our shows, I always thank and honor my teachers and healers. And I have to say that Dr. Mikio Sankai, Sanke is both one of my teachers and healers. So I'm honored. We are both honored to have you on our show today. Welcome, Dr. Mikio Sanke. Hello. There we go. Hello, Dr. Sanke. Hello, how's it going? Hey, thank you so much, Christina and Dr. Glenn, for having me on the show, and also Segovia behind the scenes. Really, really <laughs> glad to be here. <laughs> Definitely. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, Mikio, as the medical guide, I, I like to uh, tell people the journey that we may potentially take today, although we always understand anyone that's been a part of the show knows that sometimes the journey goes off on its own <laughs> direction. So, uh, at, at first, I want people to get to know you a little bit, and we'll try and find out about your beginnings in terms of what got you into the healing arts and specifically acupuncture. Then we'll talk a little bit about acupuncture itself and esoteric acupuncture. And then I want to really delve into the concept of esoteric acupuncture. And I will say that uh, you've been kind enough to offer us uh, more than an, an hour's worth of time, so we will... Uh, have another episode at another time to finish up and keep going on on the esoteric acupuncture for those that want to learn more than just the foundation today. I'm hoping pleasure. everyone will. That sounds good, huh? Yeah. Well, originally, uh, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a musician. <laughs> so I was actually a professional musician for about nine years. Wow. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it wasn't, supposed, it wasn't my path. And what happened was, in order to get a record contract in those days, the 70s, you know, it's different with, with uh, YouTube and Facebook and everything else today. Um, we were getting, how could I say, guided toward uh, a type of music I didn't want to play. And it got to the point where, in order to get a record contract, I had to play certain 
types of music, uh, which it just wasn't who I was. So I said I'd rather wash dishes than play music. And along the way, you know, the next, uh, in the 80s, I got into martial arts and uh, my partner made all the ninja movies. We kind of got into this thing. And somewhere along the way, I said, you know, this is not my field either. What am I supposed to do? And then I look back, uh, I learned how to do, I not learned how to do, I learned about shiatsu when I was about seven or eight years old, living in Okinawa. And some elderly lady was uh, doing some massage. I just went to watch her. And then she said, hey, you want to do this? And so she was showing me the points on the head. I could find the points right away, the points on the shoulders. Uh, you know, but as a kid, I'd rather play baseball or do something else. So uh, it stuck in the back of my mind. And then the 60s, I um, started getting into reading about uh, certain different, philosophy, different philosophies and theosophy. And uh, the macrobiotics came along, the George Osawa, Arnold Eretz. And then something happened when I was you know, going to college that there was a saying, you are what you eat. I was like, you know, today it doesn't sound too odd, but back then, like, what? You are what you eat? How you know, you're eating this? How could this become? Because no one ever talked about that. You know, sort of making sense. And then so um, by the 80s, my wife was already an acupuncturist, and she kept saying, "Hey, why don't you join me? Why don't you join me?" And I still wasn't convinced that I wanted. That's what I was supposed to do. And then one day, I said, "Okay, in order to work with her, I have to go to school." And so I ended up going to school, and this is all a process. You know, as you're going to school, then you start remembering things that happened earlier. And I remember in the martial arts, I learned about the pressure points. And, uh, oh, wow, maybe some of these are acupuncture points. And mm. so they started fitting in. And so, you know, by the time I got to acupuncture school, um, I had studied with Bernard Jensen. I was really into nutrition back then, working with cancer uh, patients. But, you know, in California, uh, you really can't treat cancer patients unless you're an MD. Uh, there's, a, there's a law that says you cannot treat cancer unless you use radiation, uh, surgery, or chemotherapy. So along the way, I started to think, okay, maybe there's something else I should do besides the cancer. So in 1995, I started writing a book called, uh, not called, a book about naturopathy and five elements. So, okay, there's some gap between raw foods and Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine says don't eat raw food. But sometime in 1995, during a meditation, I wasn't thinking about anything. It's just I, I cleared my mind, got into meditation, and very clear, oh, there's enough people working on the physical. Uh, would you like to do something different? Work on a higher dimension, above the mental. And, of course, you know, this is going through your head really, really quickly. And I said, of course. So the first thing that popped in was esoteric acupuncture. I got out of my meditation, and all I could think of was oh, esoteric acupuncture, chakras. And then I tried to get back in there, and I couldn't get back, I couldn't lock into that spot. And so that was the, the genesis of it um, at 95. Now, I do not channel. I'm not a channel. Channeler works on the astral plane. Uh, I'm not clear audient and I hear voices, but I work on the causal body or higher. It's a higher telepathy. So I am just able to pick up the information, uh, tap into certain parts of the Akashic records, and that's how I started getting all this information and starting putting things together. So that was in 95. Now, remember in 95, 96, I was still very skeptical. And around 96 or so, I asked the question, why me? Why am I getting this information? I was downloading a lot of information. And during the meditation, I said, because you are the most greedy. And I said, mm. oh, wow, greedy is kind of an interesting word. <laughs> and he said, no, you're the most hungry. It's out there for anybody who's ready to pick up the information. But this is going to be a synthesis of uh, not just another style of acupuncture, but a synthesis of the ageless wisdom which means the, the uh, theosophical works, the Hindu works, uh, the Dwalkul Tibetan works, and uh, sacred geometry, Kabbalah, 
uh, the color therapy, Dinshaw's color therapy, all rolled into a usable format. And <clears throat> today, people do not like to read, um, you know, thick books. So my job was to use acupuncture as a transporter of the information. And, and that's, you know, that's your, the first book, the journey was like about three and a half year journey. Uh, and during that whole time, toward the end of that first book, I started really embracing that idea that, okay, I'm getting this information, it should come out. But, you know, the first couple of years, you're still kind of skeptical because it was amazing. I go into meditation and boom, all of a sudden, geometry, geometry, these are the points, these are sequencing of points. And, um, you know, it's a lot of stuff and I wasn't quite comfortable. But now, now it's been a while, so I feel, I feel great now about that. This is a great summary of, uh, of your <laughs> journey so far. Uh, I, I didn't know. I about the musicianship. What, what instrument did you play? I uh, played guitar. And uh, what was the music that you liked? Well, now I don't <laughs> listen to much. Well, today, I, if I listen, it's like uh, Coltrane, some of the uh -huh. old jazz, something, I think it's melodic, uh, Weather Report, or you know, some of those types of things. But uh, today, any kind of music that's what I consider good, I don't care if it's country or jazz or gospel, R&B, rock and roll, if it's to me, what I consider good is good music. It's just good music. But in the 70s, everything was categorized into this type of music. And uh, if you couldn't play a certain type, you would not get a record contract. So I wanted to be a little bit broader. And uh, anyway, that was another lifetime back then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So let's stay in this lifetime. Um, in episodes 13 and 14, we interviewed Dan Diamond, who is a traditional Asian medicine doctor and an acupuncturist, and he went over a lot of basics of acupuncture with us, and I recommend people looking at those uh, episodes. But I'd like you to maybe give us a concept of uh, what acupuncture is, what esoteric acupuncture is, uh, maybe a little bit of what they have in common and where they may differ. And then, then I want to get into your books and take, take us on the journey that you've been on. Well, first of all, since I'm using needles, of course, it's acupuncture. But I'm not using the same ideas and same theorems and same concepts that were developed 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago. Uh, I wanted to expand the language of acupuncture and not get stuck on the Piscean type of vocabulary, which is, and this is not to uh, make light of the, the language. We need that in order to broaden our knowledge of acupuncture, but uh, you go to school today, it's all chi deficiency, chi stagnation, blood stagnation, yin yang deficiency, you know, those types of words, etc. And you need to understand that, but in order to make a living and really relate to Americans or people in the West, we had to broaden our scope of thinking. So during that, uh, in 95, when I was uh, first exposed to esoteric acupuncture, one of the things that came through was the kids, the kids, the new kids coming through, they're going to be labeled something, and their their brains moving too fast, and there's nothing to be able to handle this new consciousness, and so today, uh, the old academia, remember, academia does not like to change. Academia has, and the, the medical world has labeled them as attention deficit or attention deficit hyperactive disorder, and basically. They are just moving, their mind's moving much, much faster. That means we've already moved into a higher realm. Okay, so since we are putting the needles in your body, with every acupuncture appointment, we're working on a deep level, which is called ying, Y-I-N-G, ying level, which is the nutritive level, and also into the blood level. And also, we're simultaneously working on the outside level, which is the protective qi, wei qi level. So... In that, in that uh, context, esoteric acupuncture is very, very similar to uh, Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine, you have certain channels or meridians, and you do put certain points on certain meridians or certain sites, and they will activate or tonify or sedate certain things that they want to. But it's always working on the physical, emotional, or mental. That's it. Uh, if you go to acupuncture school, ask a teacher, where are the acupuncture meridians? They don't have the, the language to tell you. 
is on the etheric body. The etheric body is the level that's above the skin. Yeah, it might extend anywhere half inch, three quarters of an inch above the skin, sometimes even an inch, but it also goes into the physical. So that's the level where the acupuncture meridians are. And so I wanted mm. people that are studying in America to understand, okay, the meridians are on the etheric level. The etheric is the gateway uh, between, it's a passageway between the physical, the dense physical, into your uh, astral, which is the emotional, and into the mental. With esoteric acupuncture, since we're doing things in triangular formations uh, and we're doing it in a certain sequence, we are also ac able to access planes above the mental, which is the causal, buddhic, atmic, monadic, logoic. Triangles are the signature for tetrahedrons. So tetrahedral geometry is built into esoteric acupuncture. Now, Richard Hoagland, he used to work with NASA, talks a lot about tetrahedrons. And if you believe what he says, you know, the tetrahedrons, if you put a tetrahedron anywhere, you're able to find the active points. For example, if you put a tetrahedron on the Earth, you could find all the active points, the volcanoes, the fault lines uh, on the planet. You have a, a tetrahedron. So by working with triangles on the body, we're actually it's putting in tetrahedrons. So we're activating these certain sites. Now remember, uh, we're told we only use 5%, maybe 10% of our brain. If we're very smart, we use 15%. What about that other 85%? You know, I mean, it's there. It's, it's not uh, there for nothing. It's there for something. And on the other side, when we talk about the DNA, uh, when they broke the genome code, they found, oh, the DNA can change. Up until that time, uh, they labeled it, and this is a term they used, we had 97% junk DNA, or somewhere between 90, 90 to 97% junk DNA. So the esoteric acupuncture is um, designed to like start the activation process of opening up that unawakened DNA, uh, uh, unawakened brain. So that's the main difference. Um, <clears throat> since we are putting the needles in, it will do everything that the traditional Chinese uh, acupuncturists will do, but it opens it up in a much, much quicker fashion. You'll move more chi. You, when you're working with people, you do esoteric acupuncture. Do you ever see uh, places where someone would benefit from traditional acupuncture and do you combine them sometimes or do you stay within your own or do you work with traditional acupuncturists like like your wife uh, to answer your question you know something is something is changing in america and acupuncture is having a little bit difficult time making a living and one of our powers i believe is working with prevention and wellness Although we talk about a healthcare system, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a disease treatment system. Right. And even in the acupuncture world, it's put out there if you have pain, you know, I would put that in that disease realm. Um, so if you have pain, come to see me. If you have this or this, you come to see me. Our real power as a group is to work on prevention before anything happens. But then the next step is consciousness. You know, in the last 10 years with this um, <clears throat> internet and the iPhones, et cetera, we have access to tons of information which we did not have 20 years ago. So something is changing in our, in our consciousness. And esoteric acupuncture is, uh, is a way to help us get that information and sift it out and, you know, try to mm, get to the higher, higher vibrating uh, frequencies of that information. Now, if someone comes to me, uh, if you are a new clientele and have just heard about me, if you want um, esoteric, I'll be more than happy to, to uh, see you. If you have back problems or something else, I usually will not see you as a first-time clientele. I want to start the idea of working with wellness, not working with disease. But if someone comes in, I've been treating them for a while, and let's say, oh, I hurt my ankle or twisted my back or hurt my shoulder. I will do a pattern, an esoteric acupuncture pattern, mm. and then do some traditional points, whether it's the choreo, Korean hand acupuncture, 
or maybe sometimes master zongs, points, or traditional Chinese. Uh, but I will do that after the uh, esoteric patterns are in. Over yeah. the years, I've had calls from uh, pain clinics around America, and they've asked me, can you mix esoteric mm -hmm. with um, traditional? And I said, sure, do the esoteric first. They would call me a few months later, and this is maybe six or seven people I've never met, and they all said we had much better results doing the esoteric acupuncture and then our, than our traditional stuff with pain than we did prior to using esoteric acupuncture. So yes, it can be mixed. Uh, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Good answer. Uh, I know that when I've come to see you, uh, it's always been the esoteric part. Uh, I never thought about even coming to see you if something hurt. <laughs> <laughs> or, or something uh, was wrong. I like I like coming to see you when everything was right, and you would help me to make it righter. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember the the acupuncture theory works on <clears throat> everything being linear. You do a point someplace and it moves someplace, although very quickly it moves somewhere else. There's a point on the side of your toe, little toe that can go to your eye, you know, faster than a blink. But it's still linear. <clears throat> There's another concept uh, called morphic resonance put out by uh, Rupert Sheldrake that talks about a consciousness connection. It's a much faster connection. So when we do the esoteric acupuncture, we don't actually have to put needles in these other sites. So if you're very, very calm, let's just say you have a backache. We do a point, and we're only going to do one point on the back. Uh, Ming Men, do four around the... Uh, <clears throat> lower board of the spinous process of the second lumbar. Well, when you're very quiet, that energy will already automatically open up all the, the points on the back to help relax the, the back also. So we don't have to go into those areas uh, that you know, are distressed. It will automatically open up with the esoteric. Excellent. So speaking about that, I think that's a good segue into uh, the f mentioning to people that you have written five books already on acupuncture and in in writing them and watching you as you've gone through your writings etc it seems to be part of of the journey that you've taken to uh, get the messages and put it out to other people to teach it to go around the world teaching other people about acupuncture esoteric acupuncture so i think it might be a, a good idea for us to look at each one of your books, your five books, and maybe we can even mention the next one that's coming out, and give a brief summary of each one of them, what, what inspired it and what it's about, and how does it lead to the next one. So let's start with your first book. That was called uh, Esoteric Acupuncture? Yes. Here. Guide to Expanded Healing. This is kind of interesting because uh, I originally wanted to have the book blue. <laughs> it's already <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and um, so a friend of mine said, oh, I know this place in Pico Rivera, which is a little outside of LA, that stays open until 2 a.m. and uh, we can do these cardstock little flyers for you relatively inexpensively. He said, it's just cheaper than anywhere else. He said, the boss is there at night, late at night. So <laughs> he says, I'll pick you up like 11 p.m. and we'll go to this place. Okay, so we go to this place late. And I had this design, and they charged me X amount of dollars for 5,000 card stock. And so he was going there doing his own stuff also, my friend. So he said, I'll pick it up for you. So he goes to the place, you know, a few weeks later, and he says, you won't believe it. It's not the right color. I said, what color is it? He said, well, it's not blue. So I said, okay, well, bring, bring a sample back. Bring, you know, bring it back. Let me, let me look at it. So he brings it back. And uh, <clears throat> I said, oh, okay. yeah, that's not blue. I want it to be blue. So he said, hey, I'm going back there in a, few, in, a, in a few days. You want to go with me? So we go back there again around midnight-ish, something like that. <laughs> this, is, and, this is sounding like contraband here. <laughs> yeah, we're doing some stuff late at night. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we go there late. And I talked to the boss. The boss is a young guy, really nice. He says, oh, well, we, the reason we can give it to you a good price is because we do a lot of things on the press. You know, there's like, it's not just one. Thing. We do a lot of things, and he has the new computer to get these different colors. He said, but don't worry, I'll get it blue. And it'll be ready in a couple weeks or whatever it was. 
And so a couple weeks go by, and the guy says, I'll pick it up. He goes and he calls me again after midnight. <laughs> you won't believe it. It's, it's, not, it's not blue. It's, it's not the same color. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, same color. Well, so let me talk to the boss. And the, and the boss says, hey, listen, I tried everything. I don't know why. It should have been blue. It just, you know, I'm sorry. It just couldn't, it couldn't be blue. I said, well, what should we do? He says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you just pay for 5,000 car stock, and you can have the 10,000 flyers, you know, and I won't charge you for the labor. And I'm thinking, well, that's not what I really want, but okay, I think I thought that was at least fair. So I paid him for the paper, had all these uh, kind of violet, purple type of uh, covers, or flyers, actually. At the time, I was working with uh, uh, Dr. Stone in um, Mount, Mount, uh, uh, Mount Shasta, and so, uh, getting ready to go to Mount Shasta with these flyers that I was like the wrong color, you know, wrong. <laughs> and I get to uh, Mount Shasta within a, within a very short time. This woman says, comes out, stranger says, "Welcome to Mount Shasta." Saint Germain says to welcome you here. And then I knew the violet flame, which is what I'm working with with Antikarana. He wanted it that violet, purplish type of color. <laughs> And so uh, that's how that first book came about. The color, interesting. The color. You know, I was going to suggest on a real superficial color. level that maybe you should have gone during daylight hours. Oh. <laughs> well, they had to be this color. Maybe blue looks different. No, but now that you put it that way, it seems to make a lot of sense. So what was the basic premise of your first book? Okay, the first book was... Uh, <clears throat> A search to get different modalities together. So I talked a little bit about you know different modalities like the sacred geometry. I talked a little bit about the Antakarana, which is going to be my sixth book. Antakarana, it's the bridge that you build on the top of your head when you're meditating. And so I went into a little bit on the chakras and talked about the seven chakras from the Hindu system. I think I just mentioned a little bit about the Nadi system. Nadi is NADI system with the three major channels, Shishumna, Ida, Pingala. Uh, a little bit about the Kabbalah and put that into a usable format. Now, I remember one of my, my main job is not to be an acupuncturist. My main job that I agreed to do is to bring the ancient wisdom teachings into a modern format, but a usable format, not just for books. Oh, I right. read this book. It's very interesting. Now, what do I do with it? So this is actually something that can actually be used uh, and transported and transferred to other clientele. Energy is a transporter of information. So if, as an acupuncturist, if you understand the ageless wisdom, esoteric teachings, uh, you're going to get the information. So everybody that had, has had an acupuncture treatment from me, the esoteric, Everything I know, you already know. Now, it's like putting everything into a hard drive, but you still don't know how to quite access all that information yet. But when you're quiet, it'll start coming out, and you'll get the ahas. Ah, ah that's what it meant, or that's what it means. <laughs> and so this first book was, uh, it was a journey, and if you notice, um, uh, it's, they're fairly simple patterns. But, uh, you know, at the time, it, it took me three and a half years to organize that, and one of the things that uh, was very important and is very important is the patterns, once you decide a pattern to use on your clientele, has to be done in that sequence. It can't just be in any old order. And the reason is, it's like, think of a combination lock where you have X amount of numbers and you said, I got the numbers. Well, if you don't do them in the right order, you're not going to open up that lock. So the esoteric has to be done in a certain sequencing in order to open up that lock, which is the lock of your consciousness. Now, the practitioner, we do not open the door and we do not help you go through the door. All we do is unlock the lock. What's on the other side of the door is the amount of work you've done. Uh, it's always, always based upon your shen, the shen of the heart, the energy of your heart. Uh, if you're very, very quiet, you will be able to access that information a little bit more readily. But uh, basically, first book is, is uh, introducing the chakra balancing patterns and the new encoding patterns. Excellent. And I really like the idea of the 
uh, description of the combination lock that really made it very clear. And I would like to talk about your next book, the second one called Discern the Whisper. <laughs> <laughs> well, Discern the Whisper was the uh, uh, second book, and it's, you know, it's red because in Chinese medicine, uh, the red is the, the color of the heart. <clears throat> And this sort of the whisper is kind of an interesting journey because about two days after I decided that was the title of the book, sitting in my office very late at night, you know, 1 p.m., 1.30, and it's very clear this is part of it's about your journey, you know, about your heart. And I'm thinking, I hear I'm doing a little discussion with myself. Hey, I'm a pretty nice guy. You know, what do I, I don't, I don't have to work on my heart, you know. <laughs> Just a little <laughs> lady. <laughs> And, you know, so there's always layers, always layers, always layers. So some of the stuff in the book, in fact, a lot of it has to do with uh, some of my own getting rid of stuff, you know, all those in stories. So it's kind of a journey, but it's, it's, a, it's a book more about the heart. Now, if you look at the second book, you'll see some of the patterns from the first book are in there within more complex patterns. So the way esoteric acupuncture works is you have certain key patterns you add a few points, like in Chinese um, herbology. They'll have a, you know, for example, some formula that's pretty well known in Chinese medicine, uh, Lue Di Wan Wan, Romania 6. He has six herbs. And then in order to make it Bai Wei Di Wan Wan, Romania 8, you had the same six herbs, you add two more, aconite and cinnamon. So now we have another formula. So the same thing is in esoteric acupuncture, we'll have a set amount of points we add three or six or whatever, and we have another formula. So if you go through the sequencing of the books, you'll notice as you get further on, we have a little bit more complex patterns. Uh, esoteric acupuncture is a work in progress. It wasn't like I had everything together at 1995 or even 1999. It's still a work in progress. So as I'm also working on the inner world, inner planes, and being able to more clearly download uh, this wisdom, I can transmit it out to the to the um, public. So the second book um, is it's about the heart. You know, one of the things that uh, really drove me into, and is still driving me into the search for the truth. And the truth is singular. The truth is not, oh, your version of the truth. This is very no. Those are not the truth. The truth is singular. In order to be singular, it means you have to go to the most fundamental starting point. In my opinion, the most fundamental starting point for working with humanity is the heart. Now, mm. the difference between uh, my search you know, and a lot of other people's searches, at the level of consciousness today, and it may change as we open up more, but you know, there's only a couple things that we know of, particles and waves. Uh, space-time continuum, now we know there's different timelines, so it's a little bit different, but, but there's particles and waves. We, you know, like I said, in the, in the future there may be something else, but what came first? Particles or waves? The waves came first. So on this whole search into, uh, before I got into the esoteric acupuncture, I was really interested in people like Anton Beicham, who's contemporary past year. He was searching for the cause of disease. He called it microzyma. This is in the 1800s. Um, and he said, okay, we, we found this, but he said the real cause is not the outside thing, it's the, it's the blood, it's your environment. Going into the 1900s, we had people like uh, Gunther Enderling in Europe, who was uh, also looking for that smallest particle, Royal Rife, who had the Rife machine, uh, the uh, Rx cancer virus. He was looking for the smallest particle that, could, that cannot be divided, but the smallest particle that, at that, what he thought, would cause the disease. Went into the, a uh, little later on, uh, Virginia Livingston Wheeler, uh, progenitor cryptocytes. Uh, they were all talking about the same thing. And then in Canada, gas and nascens. Um, he has, he, he has this uh, concept, and it's very well documented scientific somatides. But they were still looking for the most fundamental thing that would cause the disease. But it was always particles. Now, if it's true that waves came before particles, then that's what I was looking for. Let's go to the waves. And what is the waves? It's consciousness. So the consciousness is control 
I mean, you know, if you, of, course, of course, it's controlled by all parts of your body. You do Rolf and you do something, and you think of something that happened, you hit a spot, and you think of something that happened 20 years ago. But the real fundamental uh, controlling apparatus, for lack of a better word, is the heart and all the different layers. So discern the whisper is, what are you here for? What is your puzzle piece? Why are you here? You know, it's kind of interesting that the biggest... Uh, Killer in America is the largest killer is heart. We don't hmm. listen to our heart. We don't. We can't listen to whispers because, hey, I just got a flat screen TV. I got a little toy, and I got more things I can get on the internet. I can do this and that. I can tweet. I can do Facebook. I can do this and this. And those are all great. But do we make time for that whisper? If you have a lot of this other stuff in your head, it's hard to hear that quiet whisper because. It's drowned out by all this other stuff. So that was the second book. Oh, that's great. So now we're on to volume three. Uh, Christina, does any, uh, do you have any questions? No, uh, Any no. thoughts or move on to volume oh, three? Oh, absolutely. This is one of my favorite volumes. Climbing, <laughs> climbing volume three, Jacob's Ladder. Okay, volume three originally came out as an eight and a half by 11 workbook. Mm -hmm. That's because a lot of, at the time when I was lecturing, people have asked me, oh, can you get a workbook where the pictures are larger, you know, the diagrams are larger so we can see the points a little bit better? So it originally came out as a workbook, but it's subsequently been revised, more things added. The Jacob's Ladder, I asked a couple of rabbis who I was treating at the time, uh, what does Jacob mean in Hebrew? And they didn't quite give me the right answer. And, you know, by chance, you know, remember there's no chances, but by chance, I had this old tape from Paul Solomon. It was, it was a cassette tape. And uh, I didn't really even have a cassette player, but the car at the time happened to have a cassette player in the car. So I said, okay, let me, let me listen to this for a while. And he said, oh, Jacob really means Yaakov. Yaakov, you know, Yaakov is subplant. And that's, oh, that's the key. So climbing Jacob's ladder means we're subplanting one level of consciousness with another level of consciousness. And that was the whole basis of what I consider healing. You know, the, <clears throat> my definition of healing is moving from one level of consciousness to a more desirable level of consciousness. I have a headache and I want to get out, don't have a, I want to get rid of this headache, so I take an, an aspirin or something. Okay, you're moving from one level of consciousness to something more desirable. What if you don't have any pain? What if you don't have anything really that you think is physically wrong with you? You can still go to another higher level of, or not higher, a different level of consciousness if you're aware. And the only way you're going to really be aware is if your heart is open and uh, there's something I need to do in this lifetime. I want to do something more. So this is the Yaakov means you, no matter what level you get, get to, you can always go to another level. You can stop at that level whenever you want. It's your decision. But, you know, we only have one lifetime in this body. I remember at least 16 past lives. Uh, <clears throat> but who cares? It's not important. The only thing that's really important is what are you doing today? What is your puzzle piece today? And you're here for a reason, not just to, you know, take care of um, first and second, third chakra, uh, make enough money, have a relationship, buy the house, etc. That's great, but that's not the only reason why we're here. So the the idea behind the Jacob's ladder is reach for that highest rung on your own ladder. You can always stop the climb anytime you feel like if you've gone as far as you want to. But this is an opportunity, hey, you know, we're, we're at a different time span today than we were 20 years ago. Humanity is in a really different, something is happening. A lot of people don't know, but there's something, we know something is going on. And this is a way to at least get into your own higher consciousness. No matter what, if you're in your center, which is your heart, no matter what happens, you're going to have a better chance to handle that. If you're out of whack and something happens, you get fired or earthquake or whatever, you're going to be a lot more uh, off your center than if you're already centered. So this whole idea of uh, esoteric acupuncture is to keep you in your center. So that was the, that was the third book. <clears throat> okay, and now we're coming to uh, my favorite book, The Sea of Fire, <laughs> Cosmic Fire. <clears throat> That's the one, the river of all that is. And that has the um, 
that has the sacred geometry that we use together that when I get uh, go under your needles and consciousness, this is where that lies, isn't it? Yes. In fact, uh, you and Christina are one of the very few people that I actually I do a treatment where you're sitting up, I do front and back. I will never suggest this because when you're getting acupuncture, anybody's had acupuncture knows that you get really, really relaxed. <laughs> and I don't want to have needles in your front or your back and you fall off the chair or you fall off your lotus and get these needles. So it has to be someone who's uh, very advanced. Or not relaxed. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point, Glenn. <laughs> or, or can sit in that, you know, if you're not relaxed, you can't handle the needles that long. So this is like a, a little accelerated way to get you into your centerpiece, center spot uh, with the needles in. But Cosmic Fire, uh, <clears throat> one of my jobs was to take Dwal Kuhl's works and bring them up into the 21st century. Dwal Kuhl was the one who uh, actually telepathically gave the book works to Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey has something like uh, <clears throat> 24, 26 books. Uh, they're the blue books called Alice Bailey works. 18 or 19 were telepathically given to her by um, Dwal Kuhl. So one of the... My, main jobs is to take Dwal Kuhl's esoteric teachings, the, uh, the ageless wisdom teachings, and bring them into another format. Mm. Now, one of the things that people really didn't understand about esoteric acupuncture is a lot of people think it's just another modality of acupuncture. Early on in the 90s, when I was showing some people in some of the schools here, the students there were saying, oh, yeah, you know, I learned 10 of your patterns. And all they were doing was memorizing patterns. I didn't want to create a horde of technicians without knowing the background of it. <laughs> so the esoteric the, the teachings brought through, uh, one of them was Dwal Kuhl. Esoteric, teach, esoteric acupuncture, esoteric just means something that's not hidden. You have to have a little bit of some kind of inner wisdom, inner knowledge to, to understand uh, something. And the something I'll put in little quotes. Acupuncture comes from two words. The first part, acu, it's acus. Acus comes from the Latin, which means needle or obelisk. And obelisk stands for temple. Puncture is the English word it means to pierce. So what we're doing is we're piercing our temple with the needle <clears throat> to what? Get something esoteric. And the esoteric is a very nebulous word, uh, but that, that esoteric means we're trying to get you into your soul level and to, in touch with your soul journey, and later in touch with that spiritual journey, which is a little higher level than the soul journey. So esoteric acupuncture, that's what it means. Oh, that's great. So uh, the cosmic the fire, this is the one that's uh, a little bit more difficult because it has a lot more teachings. Um, the, the esoteric ageist uh, wisdom teachings in this book. So the people that have gotten through, written my, have uh, read my books, the ones that really understand it always like this one the best. But this is by far the worst seller. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's oh, wow. funny. So um, I would like to figure out that we move from uh, Cosmic Fire, unless there's anything else you wanted to say. We want to go to your fifth book, the fifth volume, as you sometimes refer to them, as Support the Mountain. And that seems to be very uh, a very traditional concept in a lot of teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you get the title for this? And tell us what it's about. Okay, well... In 2007, I, I wasn't even thinking about writing a book in nutrition and acupuncture. But in 2007, during a meditation, it was very clear, oh, you started this book 12 years ago in 95. You weren't ready. Now, after a cycle of 12 years, you're ready to write this book. And the title is Support the Mountain. And it's interesting because the Support the Mountain is an acupuncture point that's behind the gastrocnemius muscle, the calf muscles. Uh, English, English speaking people call it UB57. It's called Chen Shan. Chen Shan means support the mountain. So I said, oh, that's kind of a nice title. Let me see what it means. 
So I went through the books that I had, and I have quite a lot of acupuncture books. In the translation, they said, although it's translated, Chen Shan is translated as support the mountain, they didn't really know what the mountain was. They think, oh, the mountain may be the trunk, the symbolic of the trunk leading up into the head. They weren't really sure. So uh, these points on the, on the back of the calf actually go to the tailbone. And see, it starts, it starts making sense now because support the mountain, the Chen Shan, uh, UB57, root chakra. What do we do with the root chakra? Day-to-day -day stuff. What do we do? We eat. Okay, so it starts making sense. But um, another thing that intertwined was Christopher Hills, Dr. Hills, uh, talks about the different chakras. And he says a very diff uh, hard to find book. But he said that the medulla oblongata activates the root chakra. And that's why I knew, oh, okay, the reason why we have to use this point, UB57, is UB57 actually goes to the back of the head. In the back of the head is a point called Wind Mansion or Feng Fu. And it all started making sense now because now the Feng Fu is going to open up medulla oblongata, but also there's different layers of the chakra, not just the lower levels. In the Hindu teachings, medulla oblongata opens up that sound without sound and uh, light without light. And this point right here is connected to the third eye. So the support the mountain is about supporting the Rama Rondra chakra, which is really inside the head. The back of the head in the Taoist teaching is called Kunlun Mountain. It's the same name, but it's, you know, in acupuncture there's a point, kidney 60s called Kunlun. But this is the Kunlun Mountain on the back of the head. They don't talk about an acupuncture school. It's called the mountain. So we're putting the, the energy to the back of this head to support the mountain, which is really inside the brain, which is... Brahma Rondra, which is to support consciousness. So this book is about uh, the choices that you have um, and making wise choices. So, uh, you know, everything you eat, you become part of that. That when I mentioned earlier this idea of you are what you eat, years later, uh, someone said, oh, it's not true. It's not, it's not what you eat. It's what you absorb. Wow, I ate that hot dog, and the thing is, I didn't absorb it, so it's really not bad. No, <laughs> it's not true. You are what you eat, because whether you absorb it on the physical level, you put it into your plane, so your astral plane, all the other levels are picking up anyway. It's also the mental. It's already in your mental plane, because if you chose the barbecue ribs or the, you know, whatever it is, uh, anything with the GMOs, anything with the white sugars, uh, you've already mentally chosen that. So it's already, it's not just in the physical, it's in your mental plane, which also now uh, influences the higher chakras. So this uh, idea of everything you eat is a transporter uh, of information. So it's important. People that are doing uh, pranic healing, if you're doing any kind of uh, work with your hands, the there's different kind of healers that do the Joe Ray, Mahi Kati, where they put their hands next to a person and try to create heat, or massage therapists, or, you know, acupuncture when you put your needle through. Um, hey, you're transporting information. Now, <clears throat> let's just say you're treating someone who has, um, who, who may be pre-diabetic, and I really can't, uh, can't eat sugar. What if you had your uh, donut this morning? or your pie last night, and, uh, okay, it's been a little while, okay, you come in, and so your, your, your client says, oh, what a great treatment, I felt so relaxed, I really, really feel great, and on the way home, that person starts thinking about ice cream, or <laughs> cookies, or, or cupcakes, you think you may have triggered that? What if you're treating someone who's going to AA, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles area, there's a lot of people in AA, so what if you had your organic wine last night? I only drink one glass a, a night. It's organic. That's fine. What if you treat with someone who's, who's uh, going to AA? And again, after the treatment, the person feels great. Ah, oh, I feel so great. I'll be coming back again. On the way home, all of a sudden, I need a drink. I haven't had a drink in six months. I haven't had a drink in six years. You think you may have triggered it? So these are the things that 
you know, as we move up the ladder of consciousness, these are things that we have to be aware of. Um, if you're at a different level, then ah, I don't believe that stuff. I'm going to keep doing this and this. Yeah, do whatever you want. But on a higher level, once you start working with your heart, you know inherently, intuitively that, yeah, it could be true. The stuff I'm eating could affect someone else, whether I didn't even touch them. I just put the needle. I didn't even touch the skin. Well, it doesn't matter. You're transporting that energy through the body. So this is a, uh, <clears throat> a book on that nutrition. I did it a little bit differently. I did the five elements like I originally was going to start off with, and I put biochemical elements to the five elements. And uh, it's interesting for the wood element, which is the liver, I put sodium. And sodium is uh, not salt. People think sodium is salt, but sodium is sodium. Salt is sodium chloride. Right. And uh, sodium is uh, interesting because sodium, according to Bernard Jensen, is called the youth element. It gives you flexibility. And so when you think about the healthy wood energy, now remember the wood that you, that you say wood to make a, tr a, a chair or a desktop is not the same as the wood in uh, the wood system, but it could be part of that. So if you think of a healthy wood, like physical wood, you would think of bamboo. Very, very strong when it needs to be, but in the wind, you bend a little bit. You bend a little bit. And the same idea, the sodium uh, gives you flexibility in your joints, and so you're able to bend not just the physical also, but bend your mind. So each of the five elements, I went through you know, different biochemical elements and, and put them uh, within that system. But the main thing was not working with uh, physical. It's working with the non-physical, which is consciousness. And so this is the book. Now, I've had many people ask me, when are you going to come up with volume two? Mm. So it, it may be in the works after I finish this, the next book, which is the on the Quran. Hopefully it'll be out this year, but um, we'll see. But yeah, the, the most popular book is the uh, volume one and volume five by far. Uh, what I guess the most important question I would ask is what's the color of volume six? Volume six is going to be a blue, but it'll have <laughs> a silverish type of uh, tinge to it. Silver, <laughs> I, you know, I like blue because blue is. Uh, a royal blue, a deep royal blue, is the color of truth. Just like orange is also the color of universal truth, but blue is the color of truth. But working with the head chakras, um, it, you know, eventually it's going to change from that violet into a gold and into a, a silver. So it's going to be a blue with just a, a touch of silver. So it might be close to what people might consider gunmetal, but it's really the idea is the blue with the silver in, and fuse in it. That'll be nice. You know, I, I do have to say it was very interesting when uh, we started working together and we discussed the concepts of that you could transmit certain things and how much you do to remain pure within your process for, for my sake and for everyone else's sake. It made me think uh, in medicine, you know, one of the things that we do, at least in surgery, is we have this very ritualistic scrubbing that we do to make sure we're clean and we have mm -hmm. sterile procedures and techniques and, and that. But not many of us take it to the level that you do. And I always, number one, appreciated that you did that. It, it made it very clean for me, clean in a sense of purity, not clean in a sense of microbes. Uh, and it also made me think how possibly different things would be on our planet if everyone took that process, all the healers took that process, and, and all the people that were trying to be healed. Certainly, they wouldn't have to be healed from as many things. I, I'm sure you would agree with that if yeah. they were uh, thinking in another direction. Well, you know, before I wrote this book, I remember going to a CEU class, in, uh, one of the big conventions, and uh, they were serving coffee, which is fine, but they had the equal or the aspartame, and they also were serving diet, you know, diet, some kind of diet drinks. Now, this is a convention of acupuncturists, and we're supposed to be at the leading, you know, the cutting edge, and we're serving diet, cokes or tabs or whatever they were, 
you know, something is just, is just wrong with that picture. When I was going to acupuncture school, uh, it was at night, and uh, before you leave, there's these couple of vending machines. And I, of course, I never ate their food. I just, I always, um, you know, I, well, I didn't eat during, the, during class. But I looked at the vending machine, and, you know, one day, maybe a year, a year and a half into schooling, uh, the guy that was changing the vending machine came by and he said, hey, why don't you put something healthy? He was like, what? I said, I don't know. You got all this stuff. You know, do you have any fruits or something? You know, I think we could, we could we have apples or bananas or something. And the next time he came, the next month, there was actually some, you know, something a little bit healthier. And a hard-boiled egg and I think an orange and some apples and maybe a banana or something. And it was there for a while. And I didn't really pay attention because I didn't really go check out the vending machine. So one day, uh, he was coming back again, and, and I looked, I said, and I saw him putting in cookies and fritos and this and that. And I said, hey, what about all the uh, stuff you were putting in before? He said, no one bought that stuff. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's the, that's the status of the students that are going to this acupuncture school. Uh, so, that, you know, then I knew that, you know, as a profession, um, Maybe we need to step up a little bit. You know, you don't have to be a vegan and everything, but you know, just step up your uh, thinking just a little bit, a little bit, a little notch, because uh, the people coming in to see us, you know, they're going to ask us questions about diets. And um, like I said, you don't have to be a vegan. And you can, you can see whatever, but whatever you eat, you should try to you should try to make it the highest quality possible, whether it's meat or whatever it is. Yes, I, I had the same experience with you when I ran the integrative hospital-based medicine program. We weren't just trying to bring acupuncture and other things into the hospital. We also wanted to represent the hospital as a place of actual healing and wellness, not just as you alluded to earlier in the conversation about disease and illness. So I tried, uh, we tried to change getting rid of mercury in the thermometers and mm. uh, changing the lighting uh, and changing the cleaning things that all of the people would go around to the rooms, uh, trying to make less toxic things. But one of the areas that I also worked in was I wanted to change the cafeteria diet, which you can imagine what it is there. Uh, the hamburgers and the french fries and all the things that people love, especially when they're visiting someone and they're depressed to, and they want to eat their comfort food, I tried to at least say, well, let's have so that people have choices. And at the end of the day, it was the same thing. Nobody's buying it. They mm. all want to buy Still. the other. But I have a feeling that now I've seen a consciousness change, and I, and I have a feeling now that it's, it's coming more into that consciousness. Christina mm. sees that in the schools, and she's working very hard in the schools to make uh, kids eat better. <laughs> <laughs> Mikio, we're coming to the end of uh, this hour, and I know we have so much more to talk about, so you've been generous enough to uh, allow us to have another episode with you and another interview, but before we end today, as we do with everyone as our custom, we're looking for a health tip, and I'm really excited about uh, <laughs> the possibilities here. So do you have a health tip for us? Well, this is my advice for everybody for the for immediate uh, advice: eat your greens. Mm. Now, the greens uh, resonate at five twenty eight sulfagio. It's a frequency of the heart. It's also a frequency of chlorophyll. And I'm a big, big fan of the greens. It has to be raw. Of course, you can eat cooked greens, but if you want to get the maximum benefits from the green juices, you know, uh, of the green foods, it has to be raw. If you look at a red blood cell, there's basically, there's five atoms, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen surrounds the, the uh, iron. And in chlorophyll, there's the same four atoms uh, that surround magnesium. So <clears throat> they're, they're very, very similar. And just because it's similar doesn't mean that they're going to match, but biochemists have shown that when you ingest, ingest green foods, you're going to get healthy red blood cells. So we don't want to just get new cells. Yeah, you can get new cells eating anything. You're going to get new cells. But we want to have healthy new cells. And also, by eating the green, you're also um, saying to yourself, I love myself. I'm also working with trying to align that heart frequency. And if you look across America, 
you know, there's something something wrong with so many heart problems, whether it's the, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what the name is. Uh, if we're going to make a change, you know, it's easy. Just eat your greens. So that's my advice. I always tell you, eat your greens. <laughs> As always, simple but clear and uh, right on. Thank you. There you go. Uh, well, we're coming to the end of uh, this wonderful episode, and as I said, Dr. Miki Osanke is going to uh, generously give us some more information as we move into our next episode, which will be getting more into the depths, actually, of uh, esoteric acupuncture. We've tried to set some of the foundation today. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Miki Osanke for sharing his wisdom and expertise and journey with us. I would also like to thank our, my teachers and healers, and again, Dr. Sanke is one of them, uh, for allowing me to go on my journey. So until uh, next week, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, and thank Christina and Segovia and all those in Yoga Hub. And until our next meeting, I wish you all optimal health. Thank you, thank Dr. You very much. Sanke. Thank you. And thank you, of course, Dr. Glenn Woolman and Dr. Michio Sanki for honoring us here at Yoga Hub. And, <laughs> and um, of course, uh, the whole Yoga Hub team for making this possible for everyone. And of course, each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We are grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 Eastern, Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. May I remind you that you can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman by following him on Twitter, at Glenn Woolman, and of course through his own site, glennwoolman.com where I encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. And as always, we are grateful for any feedback and suggestions. Please give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time, namaste. YHTV's Trinity of Life. Come join me, Christina Suzama, as I journey to find the many modalities that support individuals, from children to adults to elders, with topics ranging from health and wellness, meditation, and inspirational stories. I invite you to visit yogahub.tv every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. But lots of times people struggle with coffee in the afternoon. Because what most people don't know is that the half-life of caffeine is well over 12 hours. So sometimes it's that cup of coffee after lunch or in the afternoon that actually causes people sleep problems later on. And sometimes it's tough for people to say, well, I just won't have anything. Um, and they wrestle with caffeine headaches or maybe uh, um, exhaustion, a, a real fatigue slump in the afternoon. And green tea can be a great solution for that because it does have caffeine. It's quite a bit less.